well met, everyone. Welcome to Geek Thyself, a podcast by a nerd for other nerds that love geeking out over random facts and esoteric trivia. My name is Heather, and I'll be your host as we journey into the wondrous land of information. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Geek Thyself. So this week, as you can tell from my title, like usual, I'm going to be touching on something that affects me very directly when it comes to my podcast and something that I've mentioned before because if you'll remember a couple of episodes ago, I talked about how I missed a week because I was trying to deal with my audio and get it fixed and sounding better. So what I want to talk about today is basically just cheap DIY fixes for audio issues. Now, this might be something that you're dealing with if you are any kind of a voice actor working on a project, or if you're like me and you have a podcast or are thinking about starting one, this is also important for that because one of the first reasons people will turn off something is audio quality. So if your audio quality is horrible, people are not going to necessarily want to listen to it. They don't want to hear screeching. They don't want to hear echoing. They don't want to hear you spiking where your voice gets so loud that your audio actually clips and you can't hear anything for a second. None of those things are something that people want to listen to, myself included. So I have a couple of tips for you for some quick fixes and also some different options in terms of audio equipment. Okay, so the first thing you want to start with is getting a decent microphone because regardless of what you do to make your audio sound good in the room you're in, if your microphone is not good and doesn't pick up good audio quality, you're not going to have a whole lot of options in terms of fixing it. The one that most of us here at Nerdsmith use and the one that I personally recommend is the Blue Yeti. Um, you, it's Well, it's by the company Blue and the Blue Yeti. It's available on Amazon. You can also sometimes find it at places like Target and things like that. It, In terms of a microphone that doesn't cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars, it's a good option and it has good audio quality. It's what I record on. It's what my friends record most of their shows on. So everyone else that's on the Nerdsmith Network, there's a lot of us that have Blue Yetis, and we all really like them. Now, there are different kinds of mics that some of the other groups use. I'm specifically going to be talking about the ones I'm familiar with because I don't want to give you any wrong information. I know for a fact Blue Yetis work, and you do have to drop down some money, but they're not horribly expensive. The regular Blue Yeti, which is the one I have, um, it comes in a lot of different colors, so if you really want to customize, you can. It ranges on Amazon at least from 107, well 107 and some change, which is the cost of the dark blue one, all the way up to about 128, 129, which is the color of some of the silvery fancy looking ones. If you don't care what color your microphone is, because honestly you're pretty much the only one who's going to see it, then the white one right now on Amazon is 109 plus change and stuff, so probably ends up being like 110, 112. And the blue one is 107 and some change, so you'd probably end up around 110. Now that's just the microphone. They do quite often end up having deals also through Amazon and through different sites and things like that, depending on where you're shopping. Right now, one of the deals they have on Amazon is actually for the microphone plus you get a suspension boom arm, which makes it so that you can put your microphone up on a boom arm instead of having it on a surface, which I'll get into why that's good in a second. And then it also gives you a pop filter and a windscreen to put over the mic, as well as some adapters and things like that. And you can get that for $129.99 plus tax and whatever else. And if you don't have Amazon Prime, it would be plus shipping. But that's a pretty good deal. It's only about $20 more and you get a whole bunch of other stuff. So there's things like that you can do that are not too horribly expensive and can get you a decent quality audio. Another option, which I haven't personally tried, but I have heard is almost as good, is the new Blue Yeti Nano. So the Blue Yeti Nano, just like the name suggests, is made by the same company. It's made by Blue and it is like the Yeti, but Instead of uh, being a larger, slightly higher quality mic, it's still a good quality mic, but it is smaller, more compact, and less expensive. So the most expensive micro, or excuse me, Blue Yeti Nano currently that I'm seeing on Amazon is $99.99. 
which is still less than the least expensive Blue Yeti, but not by much. So depending on, you know, if you really care about color that much, the Blue Yeti just is better. If you need to save the extra money, currently on Amazon, the cheapest uh, version of the Blue Yeti Nano is the dark blue one for $79.99, which is about $40 less, 40, 30, $30 less than the least expensive Blue Yeti. So if that $30 makes or breaks it for you, that's a good option. And if you catch it on sale, I've seen the Blue Yeti Nanos go as low as around $50. And there's some different packages and deals with the Blue Yeti Nano, just like there was with the Blue Yeti. You would just have to look and see what things they offer. I didn't see any off the bat that were a really good deal, but I know they exist. And like I said, sometimes you can find them on sale at a different store. They might be on sale through Best Buy or Newegg, or you might be able to find one for sale at Target, because I know we had someone find one at Target before. So there's a lot of different options of where you can find it, but in terms of really good audio that's not super expensive, the Blue Yeti or the Blue Yeti Nano are a good way to go. So now that your microphone issue is set up, you're probably wondering about the pop filter and the windscreen that I mentioned. So the pop filter and the windscreen are designed to make it so that you don't have a lot of breathy sounds if you're near your mic. It also makes it so that if you make popping noises like it doesn't cause as much of a spike in sound and it's not as painful and you don't spit all over your mic, all that kind of stuff. So it helps muffle those sorts of things. But Beyond that, one important thing to keep in mind no matter what, and one of the reasons why a lot of people like the boom arm that puts the microphone up so it's not on a surface, is that if your microphone is on a surface, you run the risk of sound or movement from that surface then traveling to the mic and causing sound issues. For example, I know someone who's at our network had a really, really loud computer fan and he had made it so that the fan wasn't facing the microphone or anything like that. But even though it was not ridiculously loud, he actually got the quietest one he could find. What happened is that because it was on his desktop, the vibration was still making sound travel to his microphone more and it was affecting his audio. So he ended up having to put his desktop on the ground. Things like that can happen. However, if you have the boom arm, it then puts the boom arm up and the arm helps balance it so that there's not the sound traveling up the arm as easily as it does from the surface. So like for instance, I'm gonna tap on my table. If I tap on my table, that sound can travel to my microphone. I have some stuff in place to try to prevent some of that so it's not as bad as it would be if I had it on a flat surface, but it's still an issue. Okay, so after you get your microphone situation figured out, no matter what microphone it is you're gonna use, then you have to look at your recording space. This is very, very important. I mentioned in, again, my, my first episode back for the new year that one of the reasons I took a week off was because I was dealing with my audio. Part of the reason for that is that I switched rooms that I was recording in and the new room didn't have as much stuff on the walls, it wasn't as full, and so I ended up with this really, really bad echo, like really bad. Like if I snapped my fingers at my desk, it just echoed throughout the entire room, it was horrible. So we had to fix that in order to make my audio not be as much of a problem and not as echoey and awful for you guys. So one thing you can do when trying to decide where to record is look for a smaller space. It just so happens that the room I'm in is also, because it's got less stuff in it, feels bigger than the other room I was in. So that didn't help with my sound echoing either. You want to try to find a small space if you have one. Not everyone has this option. You might be recording in your bedroom, in which case you're going to have to jury rig something, and I've got some tips for that. But if you have the space, then you can take a small room and start getting it ready. First things first, you want to check what your audio sounds like in the room already. So you could take your microphone in with you, record yourself saying something. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. You could literally go test one, two, three, test one, two, three, and just see what your audio sounds like when you're standing in there or sitting in there, whatever your setup's going to be. That'll give you a good starting point. Another thing you want to look for is the echo, which I just was talking about. One thing you can do to test what your echo is like, because sometimes it's hard to hear when you're talking, is snapping or clapping. 
And I'm doing those very quietly because I don't want to hurt anybody's ears. But if you clap your hands loudly or if you snap your fingers loudly, then what you can do is see how the sound bounces off the room and it's more distinct usually than if you're just talking. Like right now, I'm just talking and for me personally, it's hard to tell if my voice is echoing, but I know when I'm snapping my fingers like this, I don't hear echo. It's a sharper sound, it's a quicker sound, and it's easier to tell if it's echoing around the room. So that's a good way to test your audio in the room you're in. Now, if you happen to have a small space, such as maybe a closet that you don't use, then that's ideal. It's very easy and it's small, so it makes it easier to deal with soundproofing it or making it so that the sound is better for your recording. However, not everyone has this option. Now, if you're like me and you're using a larger room with a desk setup, or if you have to do your regular office room or something like that, there are still some things you can do that make the space smaller if you don't happen to have a lot of things up already to deaden some of the sound. Now, if you're in an office that's already got lots of bookshelves and books everywhere and you've got stuff on all the walls and you don't really have any blank space, then you might not have any echo or sound issues because you've already got stuff up that's sort of catching the excess sound so that it doesn't bounce back to your microphone. But you should still test it anyway just to make sure. So again, the snapping or the clapping, something like that's an easy way to do it. If you are in a room like me that's kind of empty and you have to figure something out, still do the clapping and snapping and see where the sound is, how the sound is in different sections of the room. That might help you figure out which corner or whatever you want to put your setup in. But if you're in an office setup and there's not really anywhere else you can put stuff, but you're trying to figure out what to do, then one thing you can do is basically put a little recording box around just your microphone. So there are inexpensive ways to do this. I made myself one for my desk and it works really well, actually. I'm using it right now and my audio is a lot better than before I put it together. You can find pre-made ones on Amazon. I made one because the pre-made ones on Amazon were like, 30 or $40 and I made myself one for way less money than that. So I just, I didn't want to pay the extra money. So if you're looking for an inexpensive way to do it, I'm going to walk you through step-by-step step how I put mine together. But in the meantime, another thing you can do is look at getting large blankets. Now you may be thinking, well, large blankets are expensive, but you can go to Goodwill. Go to Goodwill, go to Salvation Army, go to any thrift store that happens to be near your house and just look for big quilts that people have donated. They're a lot less expensive than if you try to buy a new blanket. They're often less expensive than moving blankets, which are another good option because they're thick. But any kind of big, thick, heavy quilted blanket will help deaden the sound and keep things from echoing around the room. And there's easy ways you can put it up. Now, if you happen to have a wall that you want to put something up on because you need to cover the sound, you could hang up the blanket. Similarly, you could look online for any kind of a tapestry or something like that. A quilted tapestry is going to be most effective, but if you don't want a quilted tapestry or don't find one you like, then you could also just put up a regular thin tapestry. It'll still help because it's still putting something between your voice and the wall so that things don't bounce as much, especially if you have audio foam in the room with you like I do, acoustic foam. Another thing you can do is get some sort of screen, like the three paneled screens that you use for modesty when you're getting ready or whatever, or anything like that that you can hang the blanket over. Because any sort of thick blanket, if you put it around your recording space, it'll almost make your little desk or recording area like a mini sound booth. It's not perfect, but it definitely will help with your audio. And it's not super expensive if you do something like the blankets from Goodwill. Similarly, you might be able to find some sort of screen or furniture or something that you could use at Goodwill that would work for the wall. Or you could go to, say, Home Depot or Lowe's and get some uh, old plywood, not old plywood, get plywood, which is not horribly expensive. It's not super cheap, but it's not horribly expensive. And depending on how handy you are, 
this may be a better option for you. You can literally go to the hardware store, get a big chunk of plywood, get a couple of hinges, cut the plywood. Again, if you're handy, if not, I think they'll cut it for you. You might have to pay, but I think they cut it for you. And then you could take that plywood home and staple or glue or nail whatever you're comfortable with that is safe your blanket onto that plywood and turn it into a paneled so the cutting again have them cut it into panels put the hinges between the panels so you can fold it and move it around and you can basically make yourself a makeshift screen and then you can position that screen however you need it to and you could go bigger and have them add more panels and get more plywood. It depends on what's cost effective for you, but this is a way to throw together sort of a mobile, quick, relatively inexpensive recording area for yourself. Now, this is all assuming that you either want to block off just a small section of the room or that you want to be able to move it around. However, I'm going to get into more permanent options when we come back. Okay, everyone, so welcome to the mid-roll. I want to talk about our two amazing sponsors, and then I'm going to get back into this week's topic. So first, I want to talk about World Anvil. World Anvil's amazing. I love it. I've talked to you guys about it a million times, but it's a fantastic site, and you can go there and do all sorts of just amazing world building. They've got map features. They've got ways to link articles so that you can say person X is friends with person B and all this kind of thing. And on top of that, you can sign up for free. Now, they do have paid subscriptions that give you more options, but you can sign up for free to get started and see what you think of the features. It's great for dungeon masters. It's great for people who are writing stories and want to flesh out their worlds or maybe have their world available to their audience to look at. Not edit, but look at. <laughs> Those are amazing options that they have. And you can also put things sort of behind a wall so if you want people to subscribe to your show or whatever you're talking about on your world anvil your book your world anything like that they can subscribe and then you can use that money to help pay for something i mean there's amazing features just definitely recommend go check it out it's worldanvil.com the other thing i want to talk about is die hard dice so die hard dice they're absolutely gorgeous for starters so anyone who's like me and loves pretty dice definitely a positive lots and lots of beautiful metal dice in particular and on top of that their polymer dice the pla the plastic ones are also beautiful they've got a lot of really pretty different colorways so definitely recommend you check out die hard dice they're also just fantastic people really nice todd and his wife have done a lot of it on their own todd actually todd the owner of Die Hard Dice actually designs the metal dice, and even some of the metal dice you may have seen in other places might be using one of his molds, because there's at least one mold he made that he didn't pay to have made uh, copyrighted and just for him, and so other people used it too. But the dice are amazing and beautiful, and you should check it out, dieharddice.com. And on top of that, if you go there and use the special coupon code geek thyself, all one word, geek thyself then you get 15% off your next order or your first order, whichever it happens to be. This only applies once, you can't keep reusing the code, but it's still 15% off. So, you know, if you're looking for maybe a Valentine's Day gift for the gamer in your life, it might be a good idea to go check it out. That's dieharddice.com. into audio land. So one of the things you can do if you want something more permanent, there's a lot of DIYs online. So I'm not going to go into crazy amounts of detail on this, but if you want to make yourself some sort of more permanent recording booth, you can take wood and plywood from the hardware store, build yourself a little tiny room, set it up with acoustic foam and record in there. That's totally a viable option. For those of us who don't have the space or maybe you're recording in an apartment and you have to just make a small section of the house for that and you need to be able to move it around for space purposes, then something like the screen I was talking about is another good option. And again, relatively inexpensive. Plywood is usually not horribly expensive. Blankets from Goodwill, 
not expensive. I've gotten them there for my dogs before because they just destroy them, so I don't want to spend a lot of money on the blankets. And even the big quilted blankets, I mean, maybe $15 for like a really big, thick quilted blanket. And if you get a big enough one, you could use it for your entire screen that you're putting together. Another handy thing is that with the screen, you really only have to cover the side that's going to face your recording because the other side doesn't matter. So if you're trying to make it so the sound is caught, you only need to pad the one side of the screen you build, which makes it even easier. And you can make the screen as big or as small as you want. Again, if you're handy enough to do this or if you have someone who can help you do this, please don't hurt yourself trying to put this together. But it's an inexpensive option for DIY at home if you're handy. <laughs> I personally would have my husband help me build it if I was going to do something like that. The little box I made for my microphone is easier and I did it on my own. So for those of us who are a little bit handy or crafty, but maybe you don't want to deal with power tools or drills or anything like that, then this is another good option. What I did is I went to the dollar store. Now, if you don't have a dollar store, then it's just whatever cheap dollar type store is available in your area. And at the ones that are near me, they all carry poster board, like for school projects. One of the types of poster board they carry is the foam poster board, where it's got the paper on either side and then the foam in the middle. So I went to there and got a few sheets of that foam board. And then I also bought some acoustic foam on Amazon. Acoustic foam is not horribly expensive. You can usually get a big stack of, you know, 12 to 24 pieces, depending on how high end the foam you choose is for around 20 bucks. And the thing is, you're not going to need all of it to make this box that I'm about to describe to you. So you could easily take the rest of it and put it up in the room you're recording in to also help with your acoustics. So what I did is I took that foam board and I measured with a tape measure against my microphone to figure out how tall I needed to make it and how wide I needed to make it. And then I cut the foam board accordingly so that I had equal sides for the front, excuse me, for the two sides and the back. You want the front open because you want your voice to go through that hole. And then I also cut a piece to put on top and I cut a piece to put on bottom because I wanted something between the microphone and my table, again, for the tap, tap, tap audio effect that I didn't want to have. Uh, I also took a piece of felt, which I actually also bought from the dollar store, or excuse me, not dollar store, from Goodwill. A lot of Goodwills, which is something most people don't know, do have materials. Like people will donate bolts of fabric and stuff that they didn't use and you can go buy chunks of it for really, really cheap. It's almost like remnant cost. It's really inexpensive. So I have this big thing of gray felt that I used to make my box. What I did is I, so I have the top and bottom and the three sides and you want to leave the front open because that's where your microphone is going to be heard, where it's going to hear you. And then you also want to make sure that you give an allowance on the sides and the top and bottom for your acoustic foam. So if you got the one inch acoustic foam, which is what I have, then you need to make sure that when you're measuring, you keep that into account for all the different sides. But I measured and then I took a hot glue gun. And if you don't have a hot glue gun, whatever sort of adhesive you can find that'll work well with your foam is okay. Just, you know, follow the directions. If you need ventilation and all that stuff, make sure you do that. Don't hurt yourself, especially if you're using hot glue. And I took my hot glue gun and I used it to glue the foam to the insides of my box. Now I will say I made my box first because I wanted to make sure I knew that all the sides were fitting together well. And then I took my foam and I measured it with the dimensions of the inside of the box and cut it accordingly. Lots of measuring, but you could also eyeball it. I did some of that with this, but honestly, that'll take you longer. So if you measure it first, that's easier. And then I lined all of the insides with the acoustic foam. So the top, both sides, and the back are completely lined with acoustic foam. I didn't want my microphone sitting on top of the foam because that's a little unstable. So what I did is I took the gray felt that I had and I lined the bottom with the gray felt because the felt will act as a barrier between the smooth reflective surface of the paper or poster board and 
the microphone. So it's an extra layer of something to help catch the sound. And then I lined all of the inside with the acoustic foam. I didn't line the outside with anything, again, because you don't need to, the sound isn't bouncing off of it. I did line the top with a piece of felt, just as sort of an extra catch-all, but it's not necessarily really needed. Another thing I did is I took an extra piece of the acoustic foam and I put it in front at the bottom of the box. So basically the bottom two and a half to three inches of my box has a piece of acoustic foam there as well, just so that I didn't have to worry about sound bouncing off of my table and back to the mic as much, but that's not necessarily needed. It's just something I chose to do. And then very carefully, because there's cords for your microphones, I took a pocket knife and I put a small hole in one of the corners in the back of the box to put the power cord through. And then if you're like me and you use headphones when you record, what I did is that foam that I put in front at the bottom of the box, I took again the pocket knife and I put just a small slit in the foam so that I could put the cord through there for my headphones. So basically what I ended up with is a large rectangular box that's got an opening facing me. All of the inside is lined with acoustic foam except the bottom. And then in the very front at the bottom of the box, I've got a couple inches of acoustic foam again. And that's it. It wasn't hard. It was very doable. If you're having trouble based off my description, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to describe it as best I can. But if that's the case, you can go online and get at least a visual idea based off of pictures that people have put up of their own homemade acoustic boxes. And again, you can find them on Amazon if you don't want to deal with all of this. One of the reasons I decided to do it on my own was cost. Another was the fact that everything I read online about those little boxes, most of them were foldable. And a lot of them said that the foam on the top didn't stick and the foam on the top fell down or the top itself fell in because it was soft. And I didn't want to deal with that if I was going to pay $30 for something. I just didn't think that was worth it. So I made it myself instead. Similarly, what I did with my acoustic foam, and again, this works for me because I might change recording rooms again at some point, and you know, it's hard to say. I took some more of that poster board that I had gotten at the dollar store, and I glued my, aco my acoustic foam to it. So the pack of acoustic foam I got, I did have extra after I made my little box. And I've got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. I've got six, oh, maybe seven. I think I have one behind my backdrop. No, six. I've got six different little panels of acoustic foam all over my room. And what I did so that I could move them around if I needed to is I put them on the poster board and I glued them down. And then on the backs, I put uh, little strings. I just hot glued a string onto the back so that I could hang it up like a painting. And because it's so light, you don't even have to use a nail. You can just use a push pin into your wall. And the foam is so light and the poster board is so light that they just hang up no problem. So I've got them in a bunch of different places. I've got two on the walls that I'm staring at. I've got one on my door. I've got one, two on the wall that are behind me. I've got one over by the closet that's in the room I'm in because it's got a mirror. So I put acoustic foam over there to help with the reflection of sound off the mirror. And then, like I mentioned, my husband and I got a tapestry that we both liked off of Amazon and put that on the wall in front of me. So there's things like that you can do that really, really, really will improve your audio quality and make your voice less echoey and just make it better overall. I would definitely say step number one always should be get a good microphone. That's absolutely number one because regardless of what you do to your room, if you have a microphone that just isn't good, you're not going to get good audio quality. Um, for example, I think it was on the very beginning of my podcast. I didn't catch it when it happened, but if you go back and listen, there's a couple of episodes where the audio's not quite as good. It's not horrible, but it's not as good. And my voice seemed to kind of spike periodically. I discovered that somehow my program that I use for recording, Audacity, had selected my camera microphone because I have a separate webcam because we do streaming and stuff here on Nerdsmith also. And my webcam has a microphone. 
And for some reason, Audacity chose that microphone instead of my Blue Yeti to record the audio with. So I couldn't figure out why I was having the issue of my voice spiking, and I tried re-recording and it was still the same thing, and then I noticed that setting was different. And so it really does make a difference. Number one, absolutely start with your microphone. Number two is look at where you're recording. And then number three is figure out how to adapt where you're recording so that your audio sounds good. I covered all of those, at least somewhat. Again, these are all the less expensive fixes that I have found personally that I think helped. Now, if none of these work for you or your recording area or like the screen situation is a little more expensive, so some people may choose not to do that one. Depending on how your house is set up, you could also just get the really thick quilts from the Goodwill or thrift store and then put them over anything you already have. I mean, if you're sitting at a desk and your desk has, uh, for example, if your desk is one of those ones that has the big built-in shelves in front of you, chances are your audio may not be horrible, but depending on what they're made out of and depending on the rest of the room, it might still be echoey. You could literally take that big quilt and just put it over the organizer section in front of you that has all the bookshelf area. You'll have to figure out a way to make sure it stays up, obviously. But, you know, something as simple as that could improve your audio. And if you're doing video conference calls or something like that, you want to make sure that people can hear you, even if you're not doing podcasts. If you're doing anything that involves audio, whether it's streaming or YouTube videos or, you know, my podcast that I'm doing, or if you're doing anything like a lot of video calls and video conferences or meetings or anything like that, good quality audio can really make or break how easy it is for people to hear you and also how well they'll listen. Because if your audio is crackly and you're like, like, no one's going to want to listen to that. Sorry. I should have warned you I was doing that, but no one's going to want to listen to that and it's going to make them tune out and not pay attention. And that's a big problem. So again, these were some less expensive DIY options for how to deal with acoustic woes <laughs> and get your audio recording up to speed. For more information, if you happen to be in the area at any of the conventions that Nerdsmith goes to, one of the ships panels that we often handle is called uh, Podcasting 101, where we kind of cover a lot of this sort of information. Maybe not in as much detail as I just did in terms of ways to build things for yourself, but definitely we go over some of the basics and different tips and recommendations, and audio quality is very high on that list. So with that, I'm going to call this episode good, and I will talk to you guys later. Please remember to check out all the other wonderful shows and productions that we have at nerdsmith.org. You can submit questions or topic suggestions to me on Twitter at amethyst underscore magic with a CK. Or you can email me at geekthyself at nerdsmith.org. I'll be back next week with a new and interesting topic. Until then, don't forget to geek thyself. When you venture through the looking glass and into fairy, you know better than to expect a normal life upon your return home. Features are changed and marked indelibly by the strange magics of that land and adhere themselves to your fate. Now the veil between the worlds is thinner than ever and only one who has journeyed to fairy and back again can help those unaware of the dangers that lurk around every corner. That someone is Allison Underland. P.I. at nerdsmith.org or wherever you download your podcasts.